On his arrival in Vienna in 1828, Solomon Zulzer, then a young man of 22, was already renowned for his musical talents. Zulzer remained there 65 years until the end of his days. At that time, European countries began to accept Jews as citizens with full civil rights. Separation of church and state posed an unprecedented dilemma for the Jews. Vienna of the 19th century was the center of European art music. Beethoven was still active then, but the young composer who captured the public's heart was Franz Schubert. Schubert, who grew up as a choir boy in the Lichtenthaler church, composed beautiful masses and even conducted some of them. He also wrote symphonies and more than 900 leader that met with resounding success at the Schubertiades, the evenings of song hosted by Schubert and his friends. Vienna, the wealthy capital of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, was a center of art, culture, and entertainment in which music was always the focus. Vienna was famous for its coffee houses that became a highly attractive cultural institution. The beloved beverage was imported from an enemy country, Turkey, by merchants, some of whom were Jews. Although Jews were officially not allowed to live in Vienna, several wealthy Spartak Jews did obtain permission to settle there during the 18th century. In 1824, the small, affluent Ashkenazic community was permitted to establish a synagogue on Seitenstrattengasse. The Orthodox congregation selected Zulzer as cantor of its elegant synagogue, the only one in Vienna that was not destroyed on Kristallnacht. It was spared because of its location in the heart of a Christian neighborhood. The Nazis feared that if it were set ablaze, all central Vienna would go up in flames. Salomon Sulzer was uh, one of the best uh, voices of the time. He was, he was admired by all over the world. The people came from Germany or France to Vienna. They went to the synagogue to hear uh, Salomon Sulzer because it was fascinating. A concert of Sulzer's works is being held at the synagogue where he officiated two centuries ago. It suited them well. They were able to preserve the distinctly Jewish quality of the melodies, yet to improve and refine them, so that listeners would say, that's not bad. It even resembles something I've already heard before in church. One of Zulzer's innovations was the introduction of four-part choral music in the style of the period. Solomon Zulzer used the works of non-Jewish composers as well. For example, Franz Schubert composed music for him for Psalm 92. It is good to give thanks.
Robert was a man of the Enlightenment, and this was the same thing for Sulzer because he tried to have uh, such a form of combination of the traditional church music with the traditional Jewish music. Influenced by his surroundings, Zulzer aspired for order and dignity in Jewish prayer services. Consequently, he eliminated the embellishments and emotionalism that were so typical of traditional Ashkenazic cantorial music. Sulzer's synagogue observed strict discipline, similar to that of concerts. The congregation was not allowed to assist the cantor by singing along. Only the choir was permitted to join him. One very interesting work that Solomon Sulzer composed is May Our Prayer Reach Thee. Here, I believe, he used the entire first part of Donizetti's Una Furtiva Lacrima. <laughs> He then carried it through. This may well be the essence of his greatness, the ability to develop it in a Jewish style. The Viennese synagogue model spread like wildfire among the modern Jewish communities of Europe. In Paris, cantor Samuel Naumburg composed works influenced by the French operatic style of the 19th century. And in Berlin, Louis Lewandowski's works were inspired by the romantic choral music of his day. In Vienna today, Eli Meiri and Timna Brauer find new meaning in Zolzer's music.
The Jews of Vienna maintained their Jewish identity at home. On the outside, however, they found the path to artistic recognition blocked. And so it came to pass that some Viennese Jewish composers converted to Christianity. Gustav Mahler did so to become director of the legendary Viennese opera. In other countries, Jewish musicians sought different options. In St. Petersburg over the early 20th century, Jewish musical identity was reflected in a unique manner. At that time, Jews living in Eastern European towns and villages began moving to the city or emigrating to the New World, abandoning their religious heritage in the process. A group of young Jews sought to express their identity by composing modern Jewish national music, leading to the founding of the St. Petersburg Society for Jewish Folk Music in 1908. Its goal was the fusion of folk and art. As part of their project, the musicians collected folk songs in villages. The society's archives are preserved at the Institute for the History of Culture and Music. The group was headed by composer Yoel Engel, who used well-known Jewish melodies in the music he composed for the famous production of the Dibuk by the Habima Theater. St. Petersburg. Many people call it the most beautiful city in the world. It was built by Tsar Peter the Great about 300 years ago, inspired by other major cities of Europe. He hoped it would become a world capital of culture. In the early 20th century, the city was indeed a prominent center of Jewish musical activity. Musical creativity centered about the renowned conservatory. Here, Tchaikovsky completed his studies with distinction. Many Jewish students walked these corridors, even after the rise of communism. I love this place so much. I feel as if I'm young again, and I've returned to the classroom where I studied and played for my teacher. Anton Rubinstein, a prominent composer, was the founder and master teacher at the conservatory. Busts and portraits of him may be seen throughout the premises, even in his own study. In 1862, Rubinstein, a Ukrainian Jew, was granted special permission by the Tsar to establish the first conservatory in Russia. Perhaps it was the influence of the charismatic Rubinstein that persuaded the Tsar to allow young, talented Jews to study music, excluding them from all other arts. In those days, Jews were not permitted to live in St. Petersburg unless they converted to Christianity, paid ransom, or were studying music. This situation encouraged more and more musically talented Jews to attend the city's conservatory. A whole group of Jewish musicians with a nationally oriented outlook thrived in St. Petersburg. 
Mongols, Manchurians, Tartars, Armenians, and members of numerous other nations throughout the Russian Empire studied there as well. The Russian instructors inspired students to turn to their respective sources of national folk music. The noted composer Rimsky-Korsakov was among the originators of this trend. To this day, students touch the composer's nose as a good luck charm for success in examinations. The effects of this national musical orientation are still evident at present. Until the October 1917 revolution, numerous works by Jewish composers were performed in this hall for audiences comprising both Jews and non-Jews. Alexander Krein, an outstanding proponent of the Jewish National School, sought to liberate Jewish folk music from the ghetto and incorporate it into the overall European artistic heritage. This process, he hoped, would improve attitudes towards Jews. This romantic work was inspired by traditional synagogue modes. A decade of freedom of expression and astounding creativity came to a close in October 1917 when the SS Aurora sailed down the river Neva to the heart of St. Petersburg with Comrade Lenin on deck. Only one shell was fired. The Tsarist Empire fell and St. Petersburg became Leningrad. As soon as the October 1917 revolution was over, many musicians left Russia. This was not a tragedy of physical death, but it did have a spiritual influence. By 1929-1930, all Jewish music societies and other organizations ceased activity. 
And every composer, they all remained alive, every composer that belonged to that school began to write the kind of music we call international, or music of other peoples. Mikhail Gnesin wrote, I am very sorry about what happened here. It's difficult to explain. I am worth nothing here. I don't know if the coming generations will forgive us. During the communist era, national self-expression among Jewish musicians was silenced. It was only during the Holocaust that an opportunity arose, enabling the composition of this work based on Bible cantillation. I came to Israel in 1973 and I joined the faculty of the Tel Aviv Academy of Music. I became director of the academy and organized many concerts of Jewish music. On his tour of the conservatory he once attended, Professor Yosef Dorfman is accompanied by David, a young student, who invited him to witness the renewed interest in Jewish music that began to emerge in Russia after the fall of the Soviet Union. When I play Jewish music, I don't think what I play. It's not from my brain, it's from my heart. I don't know. <laughs> you understand? It's important for this music to stay alive and not to disappear. We are trying to provide Jews in the former Soviet Union with an opportunity to listen to and to play this music, to study it and to enjoy the beauty of this culture. That is our modest mission. The current appeal of Jewish music in St. Petersburg was the reason that Professor Dorfman was asked to perform his works here. I took one of the Lithuanian-style melodies that Joel Engel used in the Dibuk. And I made it the signature of the work. I have, as it were, closed the circle. I composed Jewish music, and that was very difficult for me, of course, because it conflicted with the Soviet tradition. Today, I've gone back to being a Jewish composer. That says to me that there has been a change here. The change is evident everywhere. Local Jewish composers try to recapture the sources from which they were severed and compose the kind of music that they once did. The pieces you are about to hear were composed for verses from the Book of Psalms. The 
Again, Jewish compositions are being created. Hebrew is studied at school, and children are taught their long-forgotten culture as early as kindergarten. Leningrad has again become St. Petersburg. The sounds that echoed here nearly a century ago are now heard in the city's concert halls. The search for a Jewish identity that began in the early 19th century, yearning for harmony between tradition and innovation, continues to this very day.